Buenas tardes, buenas noches, dependiendo de dónde se encuentren. Eh, les damos... Depending on where you are at, we give you the welcome on behalf of the research group on intercultural processes in architecture, urbanism and territory of the Faculty of Architecture, Urbanism and Geography of the University of Concepcion. We welcome you through our social media networks, YouTube, and Facebook Live to the first international seminar entitled Decolonizing Urban Territories, Processes of State Colonization and Indigenous Resistance to be held this November 22, 23, and 24 of November. This was supported by the ANIT project. The invitation for this seminar was directed to researchers that have different colonial languages, education backgrounds, both in English and Spanish, to talk about various processes of disposition, disposition faced by today uh, by indigenous peoples of the world under logics and mechanisms of urban production. With the continued colonization of territories within the nation state. With this goal, we share several questions inviting you to open this reflection and conversation, thinking about very current urban phenomena in which these processes and tensions are observed. Some of the questions that we made is was how is urban expansion at moving forward and advancing over traditional lands of indigenous communities, how are irregular urbanization processes happening in rural areas inhabited by indigenous people? How do urban planning instruments impact indigenous populations? And how are ethnic real estate projects created and promoted? Or how are identities produced through the construction of intercultural buildings and public spaces. What different forms does indigenous resistance take in these urban territories? What different actions are being carried out? What traditional practices are being recovered in the urban territories? And based in these questions, we received several papers and presentations that come from different parts of the world, observing unique and unrepeatable processes in different times uh, framework um, approach from different disciplines and through different voices. Together, they show us the wide and deep range of considerations, both historical and daily, as well as the various forms in which these current processes of urban colonization are expressed in different parts of the world and on various indigenous people, as well as the wide range of forms of free organization or resistance that they continue to develop, seeking to give continuity to their own projection as indigenous peoples, as native people. This panorama ratified the validity and relevance of this territorial issue in different scenarios, as well as the urgent need to rethink and promote new spaces for dialogue beyond this rigid traditional academic formats um, create this uh, space to exchange ideas and critical reflections, as well as the proposals. This is why we have been carrying out and tomorrow also these activities that seek to promote dialogue and open up the understanding of urban issues in relation to indigenous peoples beyond their strictly academic construction. In addition to the round tables of papers in the mornings, there will be other uh, round tables of conversation during the afternoons integrated by people who are inserted and committed in various ways with the issues that this seminar presents from the world of public management, art, organizational issues, etc. The idea is that the tables of the seminary create dialogue and receive questions from the public through the social networks, seeking to expand the forms and scope of the dialogue. So you are invited to participate. Without further ado, I have the pleasure 
to present the discussions that we will have. First, Ana Lara Haynes, that's presenting Ciudadanos de Ríos Invisibles, Explorando Relaciones en Torno al Agua en la Ciudad Contemporánea. She's from the Monarch Australia University, coming from late night in Australia, and we also have Ayabel Arevalo presenting urban tapestry and layout railroads of the state occupation of the Araucanía in the 19th century. He will be presenting on behalf of his other team mates. We want this to be a space where we can speak and have dialogue. Each presentation has 50 minutes, and then we have this conversation with the public around half an hour of conversation and questions, and then we give the conclusions. So we want to remind you that if you need interpretation, you have the interpretation icon, so you can choose your language channel that you want to hear. Uh, welcome, Anna. The, the floor is yours to speak. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Just give me a minute to share my screen. Yeah, can you see? Yes. Just a reminder, please don't speak too fast so we can allow the interpreters to do their job. Maybe I'm going to take a little bit more than 15 minutes, but thank you so much for the coordinators to invite me to this seminary. As a Latin person in Melbourne, I think it's important to share these uh, experiences with other Latin Americans in our native language. I want to present my respect to the native people that we work with, and in particular, the elder that co-directs the investigation with me. I want to present my respects to the all native peoples in Australia and all over the world, including Chile and in Mexico, that it's my country, home country. I am an anthropologist and my purpose is to understand my own position in my investigation and where I'm at right now. Uh, speaking this through this presentation of caring for invisible rivers, exploring water relationships in the contemporary city. This is part of my PD, PD, PhD that I'm currently doing in the Monash University. But for me, it's important to highlight that I come from the anthropologist line. So I'm combining both areas that I'm studying. First of all, I think it's important to mention some particular aspects of some uh, words that I will be using in this presentation. For the ones I haven't been able to find a direct translation. The first is country with capital C that is an area of land that is directly related to a group of Aboriginal people through ancestral culture and language. This includes not only a piece of land in terms of geographic space and special, but it also includes waters, oceans, creatures, animals, and humans, the underground, the relationships that are carried out in these spaces. The other word that I wanted to mention is that when I I speak about care of the rivers, it's not only in an ecological aspect, but also 
it is related to the relationship of the humans and the other creatures. Maybe this is something that I will have to look at better translation, but this is these are the aspects of, of what I mean. My investigation, it focuses on the center of Australia. And I want to share with you a study case where we can recognize the dialogue and attention with the use and displacements of land and water. So just here in the map, you can see a, like a wide square that is the commercial area of Melbourne. And then you can see like a pink kind of shape that is part of a property that was built in the 1860s. And it houses this like house and it has a pipeline that was built during that time to preserve the gardens there. They got to know my work and we got to know about this pipeline to see how this land we can understand it in a urban colonial process that was very violent against indigenous people. This pipeline is a complex system that captures the rainwater in the land and outside the land, this private land. And we see that in, in reality, this drainage is a river. We have pipelines through the garden and outside of the property. So we can, they would preserve the gardens that we were talking about. So this takes the water curse from the property to another place and it takes part in some river and outside. This was a sustainable drainage and pipeline that was constructed there. Right now, the garden and the house are colonial heritage. If you heard yesterday's presentation by Libby Porter, this is something that is still exists until now. So to understand this displacement, we consulted some archives, historical archives to see the first colonizers and we try to investigate the oral stories of the elders of the indigenous people. In this image, I am there with, now with color, the elder that I was speaking about. This was an extensive mapping of these different sites of study to understand how they use these rivers modern days to give you an an example, the records showed uh, huge displacements of rivers. And this is known as the process of modernity. These water bodies that were characteristic of this area were drained and then filled up in different ways. These are all the ones that were near the commercial area and the surroundings. This allowed us to understand how these rivers are 
in the modern days and it show us water patterns of how it has flow and how it is connected to this aquatic system. This is another map with many data, as you can see. This is a data set where you can see in the red dots, the flood, the historical flood, the blue ones are the historical records floods. And you can see all other data sets of floods and geological data where you can see patterns of how the water keeps coming back where they were historically. Water has got a great memory. That's what Narwit tells me. The water comes back, the memories are kept preserved. She says that she cannot recognize the cultural indicators of her ancestries in my methodology. I went like doing some like touring and speaking with her to see how the entities are more than human get engaged with us and the world to understand the waters. I have been tracking physically these rivers instead of following the city maps. This is the water country that I study. And I see how this relates to the flora and fauna. This is an example of the, the tracking that I did. This is a very short video of what I did. How you can see when it rains, the drainage overflows because of the water. And we can see a little bit of this underground river. After this exploration carried out by mapping, I started reflecting about my own behavior in the city. It's changing because now I take off my headphones just so I can hear these rivers. This has also led me to understand the story of these native people to understand how is their relationship with these water countries. Bringing my own experience to this investigation has given shape to this methodology that was created through a relational design that gathers different practices and ways of living of the native people, ways of doing, ways of knowing, and ways of being. These gather, these walking, deep listening, deep observing, also these journeying and building relationships. These are practices in the daily rituals, in these knowledge processes that gather this knowing, understanding, this contemplation, this reflection, that respects these relationships and where these led us to create effective relationships. These also allow us to take other actions that let us understand and the ecological behavior and the relationship with the native people in these areas. And this can impact the urban design this was elaborated through different architectural studies and designs. This was created for the National Trust of Australia to present there. This shows the hidden knowledges in these lands and territories 
And this is a 3D kind of experience to understand. With this experience, we have tried to understand the dialogue between the use of colonized land and the native people and how this is represented in the indigenous water countries. The experiences of this application, of this app and the website were developed respectfully according to this respectful design that is founded on the understanding that design is a central and alive in country. How many say we have a sound ontological framework based in an intelligent world so we can say that design is simply action in relation and that everything on earth and the universe are related. Taking into consideration this 3D kind of experience and the users in the web page, they can see this land and this territory where they can see abstractions of this pipeline and the sonic interactions under the water and they can hear different sounds of the birds around. If I have a little bit of time, I will show you really fast a demo of this app that we developed. Um, I think country, when you start to sit with it and understand the complexities of what's occurred, the memories are still there. There might be buildings, but underneath there's many layers of stories. My PhD keeps exploring how we can explore these indigenous experience in these territories in a respectful way in different parts of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna, for that presentation that will give us a lot of room to discuss. We'll continue immediately with the next presentation. I want to invite Yarel Arevano, Leonel Pérez, and Mr. Pablo Fuentes, so they can share their presentation and then we'll give space for questions. Hello, good morning. Ya me escucho. Sí, perfecto. Y ahí está. Okay, can you hear me? And yes, and you should see your screen. Perfect. I was having some connection issues. Am I sharing? Yes, please set it for full screen. Okay. Good morning, my name is Yabel Arevalo Molina. I'm an architect from the Universidad de Concepción. I'm currently studying a master's degree and the work I'm going to present is next to Leonel Pérez Bustamante, the Dean of the Faculty and Paula Fuentes Hernández from Universidad de Bio Bio. This is part of a project from Fondacy, you can see on there the reference. And this is an ongoing project. So we are willing to receive your feedback about this. So this, in this research is about the urban traces and the railway 
layout in the state occupation in La Araucanía during the 19th century. We will discuss on how we understand the region La Araucanía and Bio Bio in Chile. We have to understand this considering what was there before the occupation in La Araucanía. I have here this draft made by Ignacio Domeico. What this picture tells us that we don't know much about this territory unless for the colonial forts that were in Villarrica, Arauco, and some others, and also the rivers. We also must understand that the territorial relationship were from, from the west to the east. Yesterday we heard about a conflict that happened in the borders. Something else we must know is that rivers are considered a place to meet, not as a border. Um, Mapuche, Mapuche resources back then were agriculture and farming. Here I wanted to show also how the decolonization processes happened in Argentina. Why is this important? Because in Puelmapu, in Argentina, or the famous conquest of the desert, as it was called, it happened a parallel process, but different from ours. Their division of the soil is very rigid, like geometry. It was under the colonization law from 1876, so it was very well regulated. And this geometry was mapping the urban traces. In the Chilean case was different. It wasn't so rigid. We have works from different authors that show us the soil division with different geometry. The most contextualized this is in the second half of the 19th century. We have the case here of Oriel Antoine. He called himself the king of La Araucanía, and this started different action in the government of José Joaquín Pérez to incorporate this territory and give the territorial unity on the south of Chile. And how was this made? So they established a border through military board for refundation of the ones that were already there. And we had a new territorial division that involved this possession of indigenous peoples of their rights. They articulated the economy through railway and transportation. Uh, this replaced the maritime transportation for terrestrial transportation through railway. We have the case of timber that after this was a forest industry. We can see here different types of trees and the forest industry here. We also see here in this picture the role that the railway has in this industry. Another example of this is how farming is also rearticulated. It also changes and the landscape also changes. And the landscape starts being different. We see less vegetation and here we have these two places that are very near, Antipolpa, uh, sorry, and Antipina. We have pictures of German colonies. And on the right, we see Mapuche communities with their farming, their railways. 
their different communities. Let's talk now about methodology. The goals, the objectives are from fantasy, and we wanted to make a characterization of this urban trend of the different localities, considering four typologies, colonial, railway, republican, and irregular. We also compare the consolidation degree of this urban traces. First place, we separated the, the railway paths, two railway paths. First one from the north to the south with this idea of territorial unity. And this was a continental project, a much bigger scale. So here we have the development of the railway that starts from the economic centers. All of this area that I'm showing you with my cursor, this is a private sector from coal. And what we see here in the southern part, it comes from the state initiative. And uh, it, it started by private, but when it stopped to be profitable, they sell it to the state. Then we have a different path from the west to the east. We have the case Lunginari. This was a project also with a national hill. And the idea was that it crossed until Argentina. That's why they created tunnels. The next part, then we grouped the different typologies and the different urban variants. We first have the colonial model, cities that were founded between 1551 and 1881. Paragua and Cañete are the most representatives. Then we have some different perspectives, always considering rivers as a point of reference. And we have this always oriented to rivers or topography. In red, we can see the, the implementation of the railway, that you can see it's in the borders of the locality. That's different in all of this, all of the cases that we can see now from the second half of the 19th century. First, it was there the railway, and then the town was built around the station. Uh, besides being uh, old words, we had between 30 kilometers between one another. This can be because of the church or what the train was able to support or six. Uh, to enable the communication between towns. And it passes to be something fancy to be for transportation. Besides this river and the topography, we start tracing the railway layer. And we can see in some cases that it's part of the center, uh, part of important public places such as the square. And it shows us how the city will grow. Then we have the Republican model that not necessarily uses the railway, but we still have this kind of model. Besides uh, being an asset for the economy, it starts having different roles such as farming, agricultural, and it goes to more mountain sounds. And once again, we have the rivers as important assets and the different stops. It's interesting what I'm going to show you now. Uh, we're talking here about Nicanor Bologna, who developed a huge work 
at the beginning of the 20th century. And here we are comparing the localities where they had burned. First, let's talk about the cities where we didn't have a consolidation of an urban environment. In Galvarino, it happened the same. It stated that Galvarino had to be down to the river, but in the end, it was somewhere else. In Curacautín, Temuco, and Villarrica, uh, the urban expansion was different. In Temuco and Villarrica, it grew much more, and we had to analyze why. And then we have other places such as Pillan, El Boon, and Perkenco, where different environments were developed around the station itself. Finally, we have these reflections that Leonel and Pablo are going to share with you. I give them the floor so they can wrap up with this. Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning. I would like to tell you that this work is, uh, we took from a place of the history of the city and the history of architecture. And we believe that any process of thought of the colony station thought it must also be recognizing and rebuilding all those that all of these processes of occupation of the territory even though they're painful or if it causes different feelings and we want to make this just visible those opportunities we have for knowledge that Yavel was stated in the beginning from the history of the city and the history of the architecture. That's an important consideration. Uh, among the last reflections that we can give you with this research is that we can mention the use of this instrument that it happened from the Roman conquest that it showed an efficacy for the civic and military development that it was also implemented in the Hispano-American cities. It had an important prestige for being a layout, a, a very fast to execute. It was homogeneous, it was equal, and it transmitted this rationalization that we could organize the problems of the surface, the different, different categories, right? And somehow this kind of grid we we just have to know how to build a rectangle but it wasn't considering that much all of the accidents of geography so we have this rational medium over nature we are organizing new places whether they're public or private and we have also a role from, of the state over these people. This is flexible and it is able to organize all of the urban issues. Leo, yes. Yes, I also want to emphasize that the state, the Chilean state in its process of colonization and occupation of these territories Without any doubts, it uses some of the classic mechanisms to found cities as a political act and a military act. In the case of the Bologna plan, 
it is incorporated evidently the economic operation. There is a, an economic uh, planning and political and military at the same time. This has a big impact in the territorial order it, that it happened quite fast in these territories thanks to the railway. So in this sense, it's an operation that it's not only military nor political, but also it is an action of use, economic use of the territory through uh, this territory is a rent in the tainer with, um, with settlers and different people to sell this land. So in that sense, the geometry of the territory is something significant in this occupation of the territories. That is Con it's in concordance, in accordance with the filling of the lands that we can see in the Mapuche inhabitants, but with this colonizer perspective. As the territory is organized, the state also has these different typologies. Uh, we were talking about the stations in this presentation, the buildings of the stations. They also are a representation of this rational state that wants to systematize the different models with things that are similar in towns that are big. So we have an homogeneous language that represents in this sense a bigger mandate from the state and so how they show this economic role in each settlement. So in these stations, we have courts, we have those different elements that were making more complex the urban phase of the town. And somehow they characterize all of this territory. That's what we can tell you by now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Parece que estaba en silencio. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Thank you so much, Pablo, Lionel, Pavel, for that presentation. We have plenty of time for questions, comments. I only want to highlight a few things. I have my own questions, but we will leave the room for the people to express here in the session. I think it's very interesting, the parallels between these two presentations, because we are talking about two different contexts and urban dynamics and very different. They both highlight this tension in both places of this, the talking about networks, systems, layouts. Sometimes the water networks and causes are pre-existing to the urbanization and they are invisibilized and they all they sometimes disappear because they want the organism wants to impose to the nature recently i don't know if you have watched the news in all parts of the world is happening in Canada. I'm now in British Columbia. We had some brain overflows, and this has to do with the first presentation. And these remind us the impact of this urbanization. And we see this other logic of imposition of other types of networks 
like this railroad network that also imposes itself in the nature and, and, and the territories and lands. And this is all to advance these extractive processes and they are still present to till this day to this present. These were very interesting concepts. I would like to start giving the opportunity to talk to anyone that is here present in the meeting or if the speakers want to make questions to each other. I see one question here, question for Anna. It caught my attention, this uh, different way of thinking about rivers. I thought that it was going to only talk about our into rivers under concrete, but this shows the river as a living entity of memories. So in which sense this relationship between design and rivers and native people creates itself. I think it's very different to explain this in 50 minutes in Melbourne in Australia, this colonial process, colonization process is related to this way that Magdalena was saying of imposing this urban design in the city. In Melbourne specifically, and in other cities in Australia, uh, like I said, in this process of modernity, what they did was drain and fill with trash the rivers and other water bodies and they put concrete on top of it. So thinking about this indigenous ontology and working with this native nation, how you, you can see in Melbourne the amount of floods that we have, not only in Canada, but also in Australia, the amount of them that happen like in Mexico, it's because they are built on top of water bodies. And these are things that we can track to the indigenous history. There are some scientific records of the histories of native people the idea of this project is how I, as a guest, not invited, or even architects or planners that have a hard time talking about, talking with these native people, uh, because they don't know how to carry out these consultation processes with them. So they, the outcome is uh, like a superficial process. So this is a way of rethinking the design with indigenous methodologies to recover these memories and these histories in swamps, rivers, and others. So with this, with the country ontology, the rivers are living entities I don't know how is this translation, but I translated it as more than human entities, but it's a reality that is present in many native people in all over the world because they think that they are living entities and floods are only the river manifesting themselves to say, I'm here. So with this urban design, you cannot impose yourself to nature. So these, with this indigenous memory, we can rethink maybe the design. I don't know if I answer your question in the correct way. Thank you so much, Anna.
material para que continuemos la conversación. You keep giving material so we can continue the conversation. Now it's a question for the second presentation. How fascinating this investigation about urban forms and colonization. How interesting this creation of towns in these railroad stations makes me remember New York and their height line. How do you define the Republican urban from your research? Yabel, do you want to start? Okay. The Republican side, it's to of the second part of the 19th century with the governments that I spoke about and how their implementation with this economic articulation that was that was being faced in that territory and the whole country and the effects that had in the urban area. How it was being more dynamic when the railroad came. Like the school, the church, this was becoming more complex and they were consolidating this uh, Chilean state imposing to these indigenous people in their land. That's how I see it and how I understand it from the the literature that we consulted. See, yeah, we had had debates, interesting debates in some of the lands that we have visited and researched. We understand that this idea of what is Republican, the or Republican urban aspect is the consolidation of the borders in this period that Yabel was mentioning of some cities like Lonquimay. And on the other hand, in some innovations regarding the layout that having as a base this rectangular thing, you can, you start having this urban concept. And you have other with oval shapes in some other areas, and I think they are unique, but they are very characteristic from a period where the commitment with this gave the opportunity to have thoughts that want to conciliate idea of this nation state that was very related to the, tra the traditions, but not in an absolute way. I think that borders and innovations, we believe that 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 translate to the idea of architecture. That's what we are researching in that area. I just wanted to add to what you say, what Javel said at the beginning is that this type of like dissociation, when you speak about these historical topics regarding the history that is associated with the spatial, aspect and the dissociation of with the architecture the urban space makes sense and consolidates when the buildings reflect that and in this sense the buildings that are from the republican period the municipalities the schools like Yavel said the banks as a economic system that was controlling the production of the city and the nearby areas is a representation of this concept. So one of the things we ask ourselves is that it is true that we can not pay attention to some types, but what we want to reveal is that this relationship 
regarding the landscape also. We know that this is a difficult perspective, but we cannot leave out talking about a city. We also have to talk about the buildings because the buildings are a language that represent and reflect an era and all the aspects of it. So for us, what is Republican and not only the Republican and the, also the contemporary has to do with this. And it doesn't eliminate or reject or ignore what that there are other layouts, other records that are way more historical and that they have the opportunity to be revealed. Continuing what you were saying now, clearly, I think that in both presentation, it highlights these historical aspects and the historical processes of this position. And it's important and it comes up in your last comments and the reflection that you were doing, Anna, the contemporary manifestations, the contemporary manifestation of dynamics, mechanics of disposition, extraction, imposition, invisibilization. We also have them in parallel with existence, continuity. My question goes for both presentations, but different perspectives. For Yvel, Pablo, Leonel, uh, thinking in the analysis of certain types or typologies, how do you see these contemporary processes that maybe are similar? There are cities that are already constituted, and maybe the railroad didn't give specific configuration in this city, but they do have parallels or similarities in those cities. Thinking about the reconfiguration of the urban expansion or beyond the urban, what phenomena do you see that they are similar? What are the new, what is the new railroad system that is reshaping this in terms of urbanism, colonization, and decolonization processes. And for Anna, first that, and then I will go to Anna. ¿Cómo lo veo lo contemporáneo? Ya se escapa un poco del marco temporal de la investigación, pero lo que he visto es que ya. If we talk about the contemporary part, we don't have a conflict with the railway. We have something different, the neoliberal city with different referees, the outskirts of towns that have a conflict with the expansion of the developer industry and the agriculture, the forest industry, so it starts to have conflicts. We had yesterday a presentation by Walter and Pablo Pancilla. They were talking about some developers. Crossing the street, there was some indigenous lands. Uh, I think that's the current conflict in localities like that. On the other hand, we also have macro processes that in the presentation by Diego, where, well, in his presentation, he showed some examples that in, on the one hand, we have some processes with mono cultivations in the territories. We are currently also witnessing as uh, Yavel said, it's not the, it's not what we are 
exploring in our research. But right now it happens that it's we're going through a national process, selling the actives, the assets of nature, and this changes logics in, in farming and different economical processes that are local. And we have two examples at territorial level of how these processes happen nowadays that Magdalena said very well, the imposition, forcing of domestication of these territories. Anyways, I would like to say that we have find some hope in this research in, in terms of some ways of trying to find ways in architecture to show interculturality in the designs, as Analara said, respectful designs at architectural level, designs that are based in a context in some public buildings. We have seen this as something very symbolic to a different design. And so we are going through different processes. I would just like to add two approaches following the speech Lionel just said. If we think of contemporary problems, contemporary issues in our countries, the salmon industry, the Arlic stations that are in the territory, nowadays they will produce some conflicts in their territories where they have been, quote, treated, let's say, with subdivision systems or different systems. So there we have an aspect that opens up a research field for the future that is going to be very interesting. Now, um, following these aeolic installations, where is it going through? Where is the wine going through? Because for the first time, the eolic installation, they start to draw the wind and they are installed in a strategic places. And the last thing is just a reflection on how these old structures have the value of being there, of appearing. Um, some years ago, the fall of the Berlin Wall was there. So nowadays, we have all these debates on the traces following the, the wall. And it's not only about the wall. So I, I have this idea that the future, the urban future, is also traced by this. So we have this information that is appearing in the agriculture. It's happening in all the researches that we can see this. Thank you very much. Once again, Yabel, Leonel, Pablo. Lara, I still have a question, but I see that we have some others from social media. We're going to prioritize them says good morning thank you very much to the presenters i want to emphasize the exposition of leonel pablo fuentes and yabel i'm interested in these colonial models how the thesis is seen that it seemed like it was very weak but with your thesis i think it's important to go to that we made a question, I can finish it up if you want. So just give me a second. So I want to thank the presenters in this session. And my question is to Professor Leonel, Paul Fuentes and Leonel. How do you see this? the information you shared in your presentation in the colonial model that we have seen in Chile and how it continues 
nowadays, and it seems that even stronger now, is it that they want to maintain closer to the sources of productivity? Or like resource exploration. I think that today it's a little, well, I'm going to continue with what, what I was saying before. The idea of colonization of these territories starts or it's linked with processes that are less evident or more silent. I would say that the the use of nature is a national issue, but it's affecting the ways of economic local production, the selling of parcels. We reproduce some elements of coloniality. Because of the lack of some rights of the state along the development of the territories. On the other hand, we have processes that have been that we see in many places in the country, monoculture, but it's also part of the territory. It's not an action that it's very well planned from the state the Chilean state in this case, it's more like they just let it happen. Sometimes in the pre-urban area of the cities, they are not located with, um, sorry, they are not related with elements such as a regularity plan. Pablo Mancilla yesterday was talking about this. So we have this configuration of a model, a colonial model, just because of absence or the lack of control. That's something we are seeing in the territory. Thanks, Janina, for the question. Thanks also for the answer. A question for Anna. Somehow, the project that you're developing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but there is clearly a vision somehow to make more visible and create awareness, some historical processes that are still being reproduced through not only different methodologies that you have developed with the people you're working with, but also making more concrete this history, this knowledge, this presence, pre-existent presence that is still in this hidden reverse to make all of this visible once again. So the question I have is related maybe with public policy. If you could give us a little more of context, um, elaborate a little more on the last vision of the project, but also setting it in wider conversations of the Australian context how are these conversations related to additional ecological knowledge? The knowledge in the oral history, the speaking history, the work you have with the elder you mentioned, all of this work that you're doing with the ancestral knowledge that has been passed through generations. So my question is, to what extent this dialogue is being made? Or do the planning system, the dominant planning systems are not listening to this? Yes, very good question. In Australia, we have a very specific case 
because colonization was very, very violent in comparison to other places in the world. And it happened 200 years ago. So it's a very young country if we think in comparison to some European or Latin American city. This colonization was different as well. And what happens there in Australia in a public policy planning in general, it didn't happen until the 2007 that the Australian government asked for forgiveness for the violence that the First Nation suffered because of the settler colonial. For the settlers who migrated to Australia and also for the continuous racism and discrimination they have been suffered in these 200 and years. It was super violent in Australia. I'm not saying that it is not in other countries, but it was terrible. So in this process of asking for forgiveness, the government held a speech of reconciliation from 2007 and words that look for public policies to incorporate these knowledges and reconciliation because of the violence. What I've seen in my research is that sadly these recolonization processes with First Nations, and I'm talking also about Anglo colonialism, not like the Spanish or the Portuguese, of, um, the Dutch, the Belgian, the French. Clearly, these consolidation, uh, conciliation, sorry, processes have been only about recognition, and they don't work deeper than consent. In the case of architecture and urban planning, it's only about consent or consultations. Even in the process, in the project where I'm involved, that is bigger, larger. That's the only way from what talking. So if we're talking about hidden rivers under the land, it's working and it's appropriate to think about how indigenous people will see these aspects of the city. And that's also what I see very, that it's very interesting for me, the other presentation in 200 years, 500 years, whatever quantity of years, in the case of architecture urbanism, it's not my, my area of specialization, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But it's not only about reconciliating with nature, it doesn't imply to reconciliate with an ancestral culture. What it implies is to, re is to vindicate the memory and the history, this human history, to make a relational design that is thought with this ancestral anthology. So sadly, yes, Australia is very superficial on this. We have different information from the state, from public policies. In when we talk about basic management or other activities, there are some, some particular strategies for reconciliation, but there are no indicators, it, there's no follow up. So it's very superficial. It's There's no continuous collaboration. So that would be the ideal, I think, uh, a continuous collaboration continuous partnership that is signed by the indigenous people. So only recognizing recognition, that's the only thing that they're doing. So this project aims to make a call to change the methodology of the design and not think about the indigenous, but also the natural in the ecosystem. And the indigenous is to think with culture and the culture in Australia is to add this idea of country that is really 
connected with the nature, human rights, the relation with different beings that are more than human, and the knowledge that this system of relationships generate. It's something very complicated, and it's something weird, let's say. For me, as a Latina, I lived a, a process in my country, in Mexico. I don't know much about the colonial process in Chile. I imagine that it's similar, but of course it's different. It's all the processes in every country, in Chile, in Argentina, it was different from, from Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Brazil. So that's also something important to mention. Thank you very much, Anna. A short question following up this, thinking also that the audience of this seminar is very different, very diverse. In the case of Melbourne, how all these land claims say, exist? It's the city itself having troubles with land titles, for example. So do they open any kind of possibility or path for these conversations to happen? So they have a follow up in the possibility of affecting materially also and how this knowledge presents this initial process where they were involved. Going back to the visibilization of this process. Yes, there is a process of claiming land. Nonetheless, these processes of land claim, the government asks this indigenous groups to organize collectively and uh, sorry, I don't know what will be the exact word, an Aboriginal party, something like a collective, and they can ask for the land claim. Nonetheless, there are several groups that are testing, right? They are answering to this. So I work with these two groups that are closer to the north, closer to the border. Border is also a very Western concept. So there are a lot of issues considering what are the borders of these areas of this land. So when they we have these consultations, groups that ask the indigenous groups to come and talk about their memories and their knowledge. So it's like, who will be listening to? And inside the groups, we have lots of tensions as well. So it's very problematic. Um, there are also even some moments in which the city of Melbourne, it's easier to think about it as a point of meeting, a meeting point more than a border. Now there were, there have been lots of conflicts because the, there is no follow up or different groups are answering. So you can imagine that doing this consultation processes are very complicated. And even the indigenous groups, these Aboriginal parties, they don't fit in the way we see the owning of land. So these are colonial processes of land use. And they do not address the use of indigenous land or they don't understand how indigenous use the land. Thank you very much, Anna, for giving us context. We started asking also about if you had questions for the presenters. I don't know if you have questions if you want to make to each other. More than a question, I just wanted to say that I like the way that you propose following the 
map of the water and not the city map. When we were yeah. talking about the layouts, if the grid was around the, the river, if this if a river crossed the city, it didn't take it into consideration. And then the grid, if there was a river, it didn't take it into consideration. And then after the river, it continued. So I like how you explain that and how you carry out this like tracking because I didn't consider it in what we were, we are working. But here we don't have so much complex cities like what you proposed in your investigation, in your research. Because here is regarding the extractive aspects, the beginning of creating pipes for the rivers is because they wanted to create and build things. So, but it's interesting to think that the colonizers that dedicated themselves to move around livestock that were co crazers they move around these water mark marks to move these livestock with this organization of the city, this was forgotten. There were other water curses that were <laughs> pavimented because they didn't know that these were water bodies because these were just like little holes and the colonizer didn't see the water and they just fill it up with earth or sand and cement. So they had to look a way to move around like the water. So this, what I will say, what Carlin Briggs says, that she didn't recognize the cultural markers of the culture. I just see buildings, streets, and the floods that happen. But it's interesting to understand them as active moments that let us know some cultural stories. I ask myself, what is the vision of the groups in this area, in the Araucanía. How is the relation, was the relationship with the layout of the city? I would like to say that it was very complex because the layout was based in the eradication and the stealing. And those two concepts mark a difference and a distance that the, hasn't had any answer. For me, it's hard to think about what's coming. The possibilities of that reconstitution is suspended because of the recent elections that we had. Thank you, Ana. Thank you, Pablo. I don't know if you have some final thoughts. If not, then we want to again say thanks to Ana, Pablo, Leonel, Yabel for sharing the work, for opening spaces in this debate. And obviously, we want to let you know that in 35 more minutes at 11 p.m. a.m. Chilean time, we will have some other discussions. We wanted to thank you for sharing 
for your research for this like archaeological a work of historical processes that enlighten us about these colonizing processes regarding architecture, design, geography, and how they allow these processes. And it's important the, all these spaces that open up when you think about a decolonization of the urban territories. From my perspective, I think that any decolonization process has to pass through these enlightenment regarding this type of research works like the one that Anna and all of you do to these stabilized breeds like we were discussing and we leave the this thought floating around for everyone else thank you all of you and thank you for all the assistance and we will meet again at 11 a.m in half an hour thank you thank you